Hi to all. Uh, my name is Gal. I'm um, very thankful for the opportunity from Infinum to be here and to present uh, what very little knowledge that I have of, of web accessibility. Um, so, who am I, aka why should you care? Um, I'm a web developer turned project manager. That means a lot of things which we'll not go into because it's a, you know, therapy is expensive. Um, I work at an agency focused on hospitality, business event services, and integrated business, uh, marketing solutions, a uh, whole lot of words. Um, I like to live my um, passion out in the fast world, as my friend would call it, helping startups and fast-growing companies, uh, various team sizes, various shapes, various locations, regions, and so on and so forth. The last part is something I'm kind of proud about. If I can get this pointer to... Um, um, I'm still just a guy who doesn't know shit. This is basically my approach to most projects. I don't know anything explain. Uh, I think it leads to interesting conversations. I think it leads to more knowledge and it's what drives me uh, across all of my years on the web. So, in order for us to have, let's say, a, a good overview of um, what we're trying to do today is so accessibility on the web and in web development, we have to look at how things used to be. So the web version of the caveman. Um, development process was waterfall. Basically, I don't know how much you see, but you start right here with a happy client and you go across planning, project kickoff, project discovery, project design, there's a huge chunk in development, QA, deploy, and maybe the client's still happy here. Usually not the case, but we try, right? So, and in the early days of web, we had separation of concerns. So separation of concerns as a concept means that basically HTML uh, would take care of your content and your markup you would bring in CSS to style it so that it would look pretty. And then you would have JavaScript, which handled interactivity, but was highly optional. Basically, nobody did it, right? Um, and my takeaway was basically that, you know, the concerns were quite separate and most of them weren't your problem and it was a beautiful world. Um, what learning looked like. So basically you had HTML features you had to keep up with, you had CSS features you had to keep up with and whatever J jQuery was up to. And this became somewhat relevant, relevant recently when jQuery just announced that they're going 4.0 beta. And everybody was super excited. <laughs> anyway, in 2014 is when the first client approached me and said, I want you, we will have a project and that project will be supported by the National Association of Visually Impaired, so it has to be accessible. And I said, explain. <laughs> <laughs> and basically they said, um, they're telling us that 80% of the time when you install this plugin in WordPress, it works. And I was like, great, accessibility, perfect. So I did it, you're right? So accessibility in WordPress was basically a plugin. Still is, probably doesn't work as well, but still is. And accessibility on the back end, nah, it's just data. Who cares, right? So we didn't care about these things. This is the, the takeaway uh, of, of, of those things. But then things changed. And they have a nasty way of doing that. <coughs> or as, you know, this explains my age a little bit, but why do you have to go and make things so complicated? Um, web became complicated as a platform and accessibility was just adding up to it. So development pretty much stayed the same. We just call it Agile now. Has anybody seen an Agile project who doesn't turn waterfall because I, I, I'm 15 years on the web, still hasn't happened to me. So when you have one, please call because I want to see it. You don't have to pay me, I just want to see it as it happens. Um, anyway, and if we zoom in to the big development chunk in the middle, we have 
you know, development phases, and they always kind of follow the same pattern. So it works, but it's hard coded. It looks good. It fetches the right data. Then internationalization or localization comes in, and we have to check if it still fetches the right data, right? So then we optimize, we test, and we handle accessibility. And if I asked Siri today, hey, before we start this project, which phases are we not going to do? It gets split down the middle. So it works, but it's hard coded. Yeah, sure, it has to. It looks good. Yeah, sort of. It fetches the right data. And then management comes in and is like, oh, on time, on budget, let's go. And on time, on budget, let's go means we will ship with way less languages. You know, we will handle those things post-launch, which means they never get done. But, you know, let's, let's be optimistic here. Then we optimize. Then we test. Can't you just, like, a bunch of us will click through the app. It's going to be fine. And then accessibility. And you know where this is going. Like, if we're not even doing the testing properly, which, let's be real, we're not. Um, accessibility is like the least of our concerns. And so if we looked at the previous picture of what learning looked like back in the Stone Age, this is how it looks like now. So you have to keep track of HTML, CSS, JavaScript. If you're using TypeScript, probably TypeScript. You have to take care of browser APIs, your framework of choice features, uh, build tool features. Yeah, we're now deploying our own code. So deployment infrastructure features, database features, because maybe you're just doing database as a service, caching, cache busting, like I get tired just reading this list. And here I am trying to sell you on, hey, let's just build accessible web apps, right? So accessibility is, again, a huge thing, which none of us know clearly enough about. Anna and Manuel are well above my level of knowledge, but this is the standard. OK, so if we want to even consider this, we have to talk about misconceptions. And I get put in a lot of different teams, and I get basically people tell me stuff that I just say no to. This is the project management role. If nobody tells you, basically, the client comes in, they say hello, you say no, and then hello. <laughs> because this is how you protect people. Um, anyway, accessibility is just for huge companies that have 1,000 plus engineers. I've heard this a lot of times. It's not true. So basically, accessibility can be part of products, independent of team size, and there are great reasons why you want to do it. And, you know, when I hear arguments like this, I get brought back to like, oh, we don't really need seat belts in cars, do we? Like the seat belts in cars were invented in 1855, if I'm not mistaken, and didn't become part of standard car equipment until 1955. So let's not try. I, I mean, I would love to see the accessible web in my lifetime. Um, but I'm not holding my breath. Uh, accessibility is a humanitarian effort that brings no value. It's a free gift from the dev team to the world. Also, no. Um, accessibility is basically a long tail strategy, which should make money directly by increasing our user base is actually uh, what's going on here. So. I hear the second part of that question, which is, nobody else does it, so why should we, right? Uh, this is the latest campaign uh, for summer underwear by Calvin Klein. They featured a well-known actor from The Bear and below a friend of mine who's a Paralympic wheelchair tennis player. So they did the same commercial, shot by shot. The one above is shot in New York. The one below is shot in Barcelona, but they almost shot by shot identical, and they're trying to target this to the 1.3 billion people uh, that make up the disability community. And what I want to make here as, as, as a rule is be perceived as a front runner. 
right? Not the company that's responding to the legislation changes. Let's imagine this scenario to illustrate this a little better. So we have um, GDPR comes into effect. Like it's going to come into effect in two years. You've got time. And one of the companies says, no, we'll do it right now. And everybody's like, whoa, you know, they lost two years of data, but hey, you know, they're really cool. GDPR comes, GDPR deadline passes. Seven months later, this company comes and they're like, we just implemented GDPR because we really care about your privacy. And everybody's like, what? Like, dude, that was seven months ago. You should really take care of your shit sooner. And so you have the ability basically now to decide whether you want to be perceived as a front runner or just the company that has to do it because somebody in management, whatever government decided to do it. Building products with accessibility features is more expensive. Again, no. So handling accessibility as part of ongoing development is much cheaper than developing it as an add-on at a later point in time. I will ask this one simple question and I know you will all laugh because you've all been there. How many people have managed to sell a package of automated testing post-launch? <laughs> like nobody. Accessibility it's not going to, so if it's not done in development, as we develop, it's not going to be done at all. So, and, you know, it can start with things that are really simple. Like, the first example is how we all do it. So we include an image and we just pass it the name, like cat, JP, no, JPEG. Great, cool. And then somebody says, and says, what if the people don't have JavaScript enabled, which is, you know, never, almost never happens, but hey, some people don't, so let's just try. And we put an alt to it. It's not great, it's not terrible. Now, if I asked you to close your eyes and say, oh, you know, reading that alt, you know, can you explain what's happening in the picture? Nobody, of, none of us can do it, you know? But we do this a lot because you know, if we just name the picture, like what's in the picture, then we can have a team come in and just parse out the name and put it concatenated on the end of a string and we have like automated accessibility. And not the case again. Um, so, and if you are like accessibility nerd 101, what you would do is you would put in an area label, which is a cat with orange striped fur laying on a wooden coffee table, looking up expectantly to the right, ears raised as it's waiting for something or being surprised by it. Now, if I close my eyes, I can't draw that cat still, mainly because I can't draw it all. But, um, you know, I get the general sense of what the cat in the picture is. Okay, then we have another thing, which is learning accessibility is just as hard as learning a new programming language. Again, no. And it's not that it's not difficult and there's not a lot to learn. Learning accessibility today is easier because you can use automated tools and you can use components, you know, which are built with accessibility in mind and you can leverage the, let's say, community of knowledge that's out there. And then the, the one I love the most, I don't know any blind people who use in our app. Like that's like the last straw is like this. You know who uses your app and almost never sees it? It's these guys. I don't know if you heard of them. Like they have like five letters, they're kind of googly. Perfect. They never see your site. So if you do accessibility features right, it's not just gonna help your accessibility and it's not going to just going to help your users it's also going to make your site more crawlable and you know more accessible to the search engine rankings and this is why basically you should do it again to make money it's not a humanitarian effort we're not we're here to make money this is why we chose development we could go into ngos but we didn't so money people anyway uh understanding accessibility um, what 
is most prevalent is that developers and people in, in technical professions, if you ask them what they like to do, they like to solve problems. This is why we all do what we do. And if you understand the problem of your users, you usually are able to help or at least inclined to try and help. And, you know, so my point is basically just learn the issues, you know, how we can understand the issues that our users are, are feeling. So, you know, I'll start with something simple again. So skip the content links. I don't know if you know them, but I'll explain to them. I'll explain them conceptually. So basically, a visually impaired person comes to the website. It's not a knock knock joke. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, anyway, so they come to the website and the screen reader, they can skip through links and basically see the, the get the website content read to them. And what they see is like, you know, here's a logo and here, let's say that we don't have this one. And then let's pretend these are links as well and say, okay, these are like about contact us, why we're so different, but we're not, um, and something else. Right? So I, I come to this website, I see the logo, there's no, this link doesn't exist. So I come to, and the screen reader goes logo about contact us, blog, and I say, okay, I want to read their blog, I want to see what's so different about them. I click, I go to the next page, logo, about, blog, contact us, no, 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 no. And he has to, like, read the nav bar a million times. And skip to main content is a simple link that just appears for, like, screen readers and says, hey, you probably want to skip here. Here's where the content is. And, you know, solves the problem. Accessibility simulators. If you don't know, understand what your users are feeling, you can install a Chrome plugin. It's that simple. It can simulate a bunch of different things, like how does the website look? How does the website feel? How hard it is or easy it is to use the website um, in, in this mode? Svelte. Why Svelte? You know, I love it when a compiler yells at me, and I will explain. So, Svelte, for those that don't know, um, is a front-end framework, and it's got a little bit of a different approach, so it's a compiler. Basically, it takes your code, and it just compiles it to JavaScript, okay? And they've decided that accessibility should be part of their docs. Now, if a boss comes to you and says, hey, we really love what you're doing, but there's no accessibility features, yada, 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 and everybody's like, ah, oh, accessibility features again. Anyway, people are like, oh, you know, but this person managed to push their code without having any accessibility features, and maybe the boss likes this person more than they like me, and maybe I should change jobs or change professions, or maybe I should go to Mars. Anyway, I died, you know, before we go off in a wrong tangent. If you have this as part of the compilation warning where accessibility warnings are like, hey, dude, like you forgot the alt tag or whatever, you can just implement a nameless corpo policy. And we can all love nameless corpo policies in, that, in this context, which is like, we're not going to merge any code that has any compiler warnings. And suddenly, accessibility solved. Like, people that want their code merged will just handle it as part of a standard process and will get the same uh, treatment as any other part of the process. Headless component frameworks, you should do it. Why? Because there's this thing, like this is the bane of web, is the modo. You know, it slides out. And if you want an accessible modal, like you have to make sure that when this modal slides out, when you click on this open slide over menu, it slides out. Now you have to trap focus, which means that if you hit tab, you can only go from X to close through all the fields here, which are imaginary fields, but close and take action. I am not allowed to be able to slide 
this thing back and forth. Why? Because if I can slide it and if I don't trap focus, the screen reader reads it. So, you know, people come in, they click open slide over <laughs> and they get some sort of like, you know, they're expecting this. But in the background, it's like, oh, we were founded in 1925 and something, something happens. And they're confused. They leave your site. Well, what, what happens when they leave your site? They don't leave you money. Meaning, again, not a humanitarian effort. We just have to do it. If you want some examples, you have Headless UI, which deals with Vue and React. You have Radix, which is React. Think Headless Alpine JS components if you're into, into Alpine. AKA you don't understand JavaScript like me. Um, and then the last point I want to make. So the first time I read accessibility, which you know, I, it was written in a weird font and I was like, oh, ally, that sounds like a great thing. Anyway, um, it is truly uh, like you have the ability to be the ally. You have the ability to be a person or organization that actively supports the right of a minority or marginalized group without being a member of it. You know, if you could put that, put that on a pin, man. Anyway. Um, you have the ability to do this and um, you have the technical knowledge and you're inside the teams that are building these products if we want the web platform as a whole to be better. We have to do better. Thanks. First of all, uh, this is really great. Uh, I agree with you most on, anything, or, or on everything, but just to challenge you for a second, sure. don't you think that AI or ChatGPT is basically changing everything? How we scan websites, how we interact with websites, maybe even with web apps, meaning that people with uh, accessibility issues will have easier ways to access all the content that they want in a much faster way. True. That is true. But I think, um, you know, when we started to talk, really like start discussing accessibility on a regular basis was basically when it became a fourth metric of the Google, Google page speed thing, right? Nobody cared before that. Like, I want to have like, you went from, I want to have 300s to I want to have now 400s. It's the same. I think, you know, AI has the potential to do it. Whether AI will be able to ingest those websites easier because accessibility is already handled? Maybe, maybe not. You know, you could probably take the cat picture and throw it into AI and have it auto-generate what's in the picture. It's probably pretty good at that already. Um, and maybe you could handle some projects like that. Sure. Um, and yeah, sure, the tools will change. Hopefully they, they automate some of this stuff away. But at the moment, uh, we still have to do it like semi-manually. Thank you. Can I add a little bit to this? Yeah, sure. Uh, JAWS and Nevada, some of the most often used screen readers, already implemented some of the AI features in it. Um, but they're not useful at all currently. Uh, we did a lot of AI testing on our behalf. Um, and if you put the same input to the AI and repeat the questions, you will get different and different answers. And then often you will get wrong answers. What AI is good at currently is representing the data which is quite mathematical, like graphs and very exact data about pictures, about asking it questions about uh, um, is it accessible or not, it's mostly wrong answers uh, than the true answers. Okay. So we are hoping it will become there, but it's not there yet. Sort of like the web. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Since you're not uh, only a web developer anymore, but the manager who is handling basically everything and it's related to our presentation later, uh, like is the same story on uh, for mobile apps? Uh, I don't have that much in insight into mobile apps, but probably, um, um, you know, I, I think the challenge is, as some of my friends who are really into accessibility and accessibility features, um, 
would say it's not really a technical challenge. The challenge is convincing people why they want to do it. This is the hard part. Like, um, if you get to, this is a problem we don't know how to solve, you solve it just like developers solved any problem since the invention of internet. You Google it. Now you have Stack Overflow. You'll probably get a bad answer, but at least you'll get some more content. You'll know what the term is called. Like, you know, my user doesn't know what's happening here or there or somewhere. Like, you know, I, I st like I work in an agency and sometimes we get clients who have been with us for 20 years and don't really understand web still. And I had a call about a month ago from a lady and she said, I need you to fix the working hours of my website. I said, great. <laughs> Which website? She said, I don't know. I was like, okay, <laughs> that's going to be a little trickier. So it's, it's the same thing. Like you're trying to gather enough information so that you can Google for it because accessibility has go, grown enough that there are standardized solutions, that there are solutions that are included in frameworks and whatever, you know. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Are there any, like, let's say good examples in the region or, or in Slovenia maybe? I mean, Uh, in terms of, of products being yeah. pushed out, yeah. or probably yours to be honest, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you don't know the example, just, um, no, I know that some, some testing was done by a friend of mine. I can put you in touch. Uh, he was doing extensive testing with, uh, basically, um, mm, the student, so student, uh, disabled student society in, in Ljubljana. And he was doing various, so not just visually impaired, but also, you know, various devices, the, the devices that allowed the user to look at certain parts of the monitor and move the mouse with it and so on and so forth. And basically, yeah, so we, we've discussed this and he said, basically, it's, you know, it's, it's not technically challenging. The challenge is, you know, how do you do this? consistently you know it's not just the markup of the website now you have I don't know a detached CMS the contents coming from somewhere else you probably have no control in terms of how it looks what shape it's in and who's you know actually doing the input of data so you now again can't control all the variables down the pipeline um, so I think it's it's the awareness it's the knowledge it's the automated ways in which we can say, okay, you know, maybe we have some problem areas here that we weren't aware of before. But yeah, I, I can say uh, maybe more from our experience when you're selling something like this is that um, mostly we are, um, the issue is budget, right? Mm -hmm. um, because, okay, you, you had one slide where you said it's, it's not, yeah. is the, the same? I, I couldn't agree because some Someone needs to prepare everything and uh, think about it and uh, go over that. So that's a, that's a budget. Um, but uh, yeah, we, I'm personally challenging with uh, how to how to you know to find that the budget, how to explain to our clients and and the you know, meetings and everything what is the value. Right? That's that's why it's very important to have this kind of events and to you know <laughs> to aware. But it's, uh, it's, it's always very challenging when you come to the budget, especially here in, in, in maybe Slovenia or region. It's just, you know, closing their eyes and it's... Yeah, I, I would agree. And I would still, I mean, I, I take a lot of the parallels with, with automated testing. Yeah. And, you know, automated testing is like, this will help you have a better app. And, you know, translates to this is a bigger budget, basically for the client and the clients mostly says, can we cut this out? We don't really need it. Yada, yada, yada. We can manually test. And what we've done throughout the course of the past few years is we have started to explain to clients, basically, you know, we, we've taken the same story and we turned it around, which is what project managers and salespeople do. Anyway, um, where we said, this is going to save you time because every time we push a new feature, the developer of, you know, doesn't have to go back and click through every screen of your app, just the parts that he touched. So it's going to, you know, 
it became part of the service. It's, uh, it's the part that the developer needs for him to be the magnificent unicorn, you know, jumping across the, 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 the grassy knoll or whatever. Um, anyway, so I think the accessibility is, gets pushed when it's sort of sweeped under the rug a little bit. It's like, um, you know, we have these, we have a standardized compilation system that we use with every client that just yells at us when we don't do accessibility. So I guess we'll just handle this as we go. Um, I think we are still at that part of the conversation where it's going to be like that for a while. Yes. One more question. So, um, uh, you know, the accessibility is just like a, at the moment it's a set of set of standards that you need to implement either on your web or either on your mobile. If you have a like, if you have a power to do that, um, like, what's the thing that you're missing? Like, what do you, what would you say that we would need to add to you know like the set of rules to set you know like has the accessibility initiative? To solve, you know, like um, some common problem that you know anybody can have, maybe that, that, that you have, but nobody did thought about that before, or maybe it's currently not possible with the current, you know, set of technical skills or platforms that we have. So one thing that you would like to, to, to like the have. the thing that made me sad recently in my very beautiful home country is I've seen disability organizations jump into the fray of this upcoming thing and basically again say you know we can do some automated testing for you and it's going to cost you x you know and we're going to provide you a very beautiful report and if you pay us 10x we will also find a development team who will fix this for you okay right the problem is that web would be better if people knew where to turn, to be honest. If they could talk to developers, they would you know, get info from the developers saying, you should probably do this if you're really going to that direction. If, and if that service is paid for, you know, it's not an issue. Um, from what I've heard, the, the control mechanisms or the law mechanisms were really took this position, which I think was, was great because the disability organization that should be pushing this didn't, uh, which was like, if we find issues, we will tell you. There are issues. There, is, you know, there are tools where you can test this. Uh, this is the error codes that or you'll be able to see these things in your own console versus I will provide you with some grainy screenshot and hope for the best, right? So we are not in a position to punish, but we're in a position to sort of make you aware, you know, give you enough time and, and work with you to fix this. And I think this is, the, this is what I'm missing from, from this approach where it's like, you know, I will tell you, I will put the PDF to you and just a regular mom and pop shop will not be able to, you know, even by taking that report, uh, do the work that's needed for the web to become better. Do you think that this is because we're, we're oh, sorry if I hijacked something else's time? Like, do you think that this is because we're just looking, you know, the whole accessibility thing as, you know, like administrational stuff? Like, it's just another thing that we need to put, you know, like the, the, the thick box, box, yeah. Or, like, do you, are we really on that well that we really want to sort that problem, you know, as, as a whole? No, that's why you have a relation. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I think in, in this, we, we are ticking boxes in this region, you know, in this country. Um, I think we, this is the, the place where you tick boxes. Um, I think that some of the, you know, U.S. markets maybe uh, have deeper connections with the ADA. They have, um, and the set of punishments is just, you know, it's, it's harsher, to be honest. Like, if we talk about physical accessibility of spaces. I had a friend, you know, he would go to New York, a nightclub didn't have like accessible spaces. He called the cops, the cops came, they shut the bar down, they said, you know, make a ramp. Basically you're shut down until the ramp is built. Um, 
likely this is not <laughs> where we are. <laughs> so yeah, you know, you're Croatian, I'm Slovenian, so I can say this is not how we do things in this country. <laughs> Because they would accuse you of hate, and I'm just native. No, I'm just disappointed, which is a normal state for a Slovenian, by the way. Um, uh, I'll be around, so we can talk later. <laughs> <laughs>